I know there's lots of excitement because this is our first lecture in, in person here, but I'm going to get started. Welcome everyone to the first Waywinning lecture of the 2022-23 academic year. My name is Jan Stewart and I'm the Interim Provost and Vice President Academic here at the University of Winnipeg. I acknowledge that we are on the University of Winnipeg is located on Treaty 1 territory, the home and traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Ininu, and Dakota peoples, and the heartland of the Métis people. We acknowledge that our water is sourced from Shoal Lake, 40 First Nation in Treaty 3 territory. The Waywinnie Lecture Series was established by the Canoe family in memory of the late Dr. Tabaganasquid Canoe. Uh, the lecture series was a vision that he had about the Indigenous education, which was to bring the best and brightest to the University of Winnipeg students, faculty, and the public to discuss topics that are important to Indigenous peoples. To Boganasquit, I know I'm not saying that exactly right, I'm sorry, was a respected Anishinaabe leader and elder, teacher, healer, honorary degree recipient, and was very committed to the University of Winnipeg community, as well as promoting the rich intellectual life of Indigenous people. The Waywini Lecture Series was established with the spirit of caring for promoting the intellectual life of Indigenous people and we have many brilliant Indigenous people in our community, and this series is a way for us to celebrate this brilliance. I would like to acknowledge the Waywini Advisory Committee, which is comprised of Indigenous scholars from the University of Winnipeg. They are Dr. Julie Negum, Dr. Julie Peltier, Dr. Mary Jane McCallum, Karen Froman, Dr. Jamie Cedro, Dr. Paul De Pasquale and Darren Kushlein. At this time, I would like to introduce our distinguished lecturer today. We are pleased that Senator Mary Jane McCallum is with us today. Her topic of today's presentation is, as a ward of the state, Senator Mary Jane McCallum sent to residential school in 1957 for re-education talks about reconciliation and conciliation. Senator Mary Jane McCallum is a Cree woman from Barren Lands First Nation in Brochet, Manitoba. She attended the Guy Hill Residential School from 1957 to 1968. Senator McCallum spent nearly five decades providing care to First Nations in Manitoba as a dental nurse, dental hygienist, dental therapist, and dentist. In 2017, Senator McCallum was appointed to the Senate of Canada as a representative of Manitoba. She assumed this mantle with reconciliation top of mind, recognizing its importance for Canada if we are to be recognized as human rights leaders. Senator McCallum often speaks to diverse groups about residential schooling. She believes that Canada must never forget the genocide of their original peoples and that lateral and vertical violence against Indigenous peoples persists today, a result of sustained governmental policies. In recognizing and reclaiming autonomy, she believes that Indigenous peoples are well on their journey towards reclaiming spirit and power. Please welcome Senator McCallum. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see all of you. And it's so good to feel the energy in the room, the bubbling vitality that everyone was talking with. So I welcome that. I would like to start off with a prayer. Kitsumanitu kinanaskomitin, idum stay median. Kitoma anutsi one skyan. Tapatitayan, Tichay Wastinskata. 
Kitsumanutu, Piwitap Minana Nuts, Tapita Uyak, Tawichi Yak, Questa Tuta Magn Tatuskawina. Creator, thank you for all the bounty that you give us, for the, the privilege of waking another day, and for drawing breath once again, for the ability to see the earth, sky, and water, and for the people that are gathered here today. I thank you for the ability to think critically, to see, to hear, to speak, to pray, and for, for full mobility of my arms and legs. Creator, come and sit with us today to hear us, to help us, to do the work that we need to do. It's important for me to start off in Cree, because in residential school, as you know, our language, languages were taken away. And that um, every time I speak, every time I look deep within myself, to find myself, the, the original little girl that went in, I take back a bit of the spirit and the power that was taken away from me. I want to acknowledge my, um, our ancestors who have gone into the spirit world for their tenacity, their persistence, patience, and love to lay the path for us so that each generation would progress to the best of their ability. What they have done for us, we, as living ancestors, we will do for the generations yet to come. I want to acknowledge my family, elders, community who raised me, taught me and demonstrated the values of sharing compassion, patience, love, laughter, humor, joy, acceptance, worth, belonging, safety, and work ethic. And I got that. I went to school when I was five, but I had all these teachings already. And when I went in, these were removed, and instead, we were forced to, um, to adopt another identity and to adopt um, blind obedience. They taught me it was OK to be creative, curious, spontaneous, while well, they showed me the traditions of our culture so that I would one day be able to tend the fires of a home fire. This land-based education was interrupted by residential school. And um, I'm going to share with you, I wrote a chapter in a book about the healing that I'm doing. And it is not the wound that teaches us. It's the healing that we do once we say we have been wounded. And it's that journey that, that, um, that is important. And I wanted to quote from uh, Richard Wagamis. He has really, I really use a lot of his stuff. And um, he says, I spent years patrolling the margins of things, believing that from there I could observe and know. But the truth is I couldn't and didn't until I learned to walk into the center and even deeper into the very center of the center where now is. Now is perfect. It is honest and elegant and pure. This moment, this quiet instant of mourning, Riding in solitude becomes so much more when I know that I have an earth to plant my feet on, a sky to gaze up at and ponder the great mystery, and a heart beating blood through the vessel of my body. Open to everything, immune to nothing, I can live here. This life beyond the margins. And the reason that's important is that when I went, um, into residential school, 
you know, it's, it's about assimilation. They take from you what is unique to you and they put um, characteristics or behaviors or, you know, we stop, started to adopt what the nuns and priests believed in. And um, so, you know, for a while, as I was going through this, so I was there for 11 years, I thought, okay, if I become a little white girl, then I'm going to be accepted. And in the end, at some point, I realized that is impossible because I will never be accepted as anything but at that time like a savage, an Indian. And, um, and that's where I started my journey into starting to see who I was. And it was very difficult. But at the beginning, I would say to, um, uh, when I would do dentistry, I would say, oh, I wish these people would know that they need to do this. You know, I had become the colonizer, right? I had taken that cloak. And I, it was, and this, this was on my reserve. And these were my family. And um, I did that for maybe 10 years after I graduated from dentistry. And then I realized that was wrong, that I needed to start looking at who I was. You know, because with um, Western teaching, it, tell, it isolates the mouth from the rest of the body. It isolates the spirit. It isolates um, different parts of our lives, you know, whether it's housing or whether it's um, employment. And that kind of silo goes against indigenous thinking, which is intersectionality and thinking of the body as a whole. In the end, I started to look at my clinical work and whatever you do, you know, wherever you're going to be. I started looking at my clinical work as ceremony, that I was there to provide a service and I needed to do it in a gentle, loving way. So it was a ceremony. And that the clinic room, the space that you have when you bring people in, it's sacred space. And, um, and if I had any negative energy, you know, that I would get rid of it before I treated my patients, because you transfer energy between people. And, um, and I knew that was um, the way I wanted to practice. And, you know, before that, it would be like drill, fill, and bill, and you work as fast as you can, because it's about money. And it didn't matter at the end. And I always thought money would solve my problems. I remember thinking, I can't wait to graduate and then I'll make all this money and I'll, all my problems will go away. And of course it didn't. And um, I just wanted to share with that with you before I start reading. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to speak at the moment. It's the more important that we we discuss what, you know, the questions or comments you have. And no question is unacceptable. You need to ask the questions. My two daughters said to me, Mom, our friends would like to ask questions, but they're afraid because they think it'll be racist. And, you know, and with that, I always encourage people to either ask publicly or you can send it to me privately and I can answer you. The title of my book is um, Bless Me Father for I Have Sinned. The man was strapped to the large wheel that continued to turn endlessly. At the base of the cycle, the sharp points of metal which were anchored to the ground tore into his stomach. At the peak of the cycle, salt was poured into his wounds. The flames of the fire threw great heat in the labyrinth and roared closely to the wheel. As the wheel reached the ground level, 
that a pitcher of water was just outside his reach and the heat was unbearable and so his thirst was even more unbearable. This image of hell that I envisioned won me first class in religion, first prize in religion class. This fear of hell has remained with me throughout my life and I believe, and I still believe today that I will end up in hell. And that is the, I realized at some point in the last two months that the most devastating part of my growth in residential school was the notion of sin. You know, because we entered, children are, are pure. You know, you enter at five and right away you're a bad girl just because you're Indian, because you wear moccasins, you know, because you have long hair. And then they start doing away with those personal parts of ours, you know, like cutting my hair and um, forbidding us from speaking Cree and taking away our clothes, which we never got back. So it's that kind of disrespect, that kind of objectivity, that kind of, you know, that you're not worth anything. That downslide started at that point. Today, as an adult, I continue to judge myself as harshly as I did as a child. As a child, I didn't yet have life experience to use as a sounding board, and I wanted acceptance, because all of us do. So anything that was taught to me, I gave more than 100%. When I was a child, the notion of sin that was taught to me went against how I now understand spirituality today lifelong learning and failure, mentorship, love, tolerance, forgiveness, compassion. Instead of learning about tolerance and forgiveness through confession, which is what the Catholic Church says, I learned shame, and I learned it very, very well. Every moment in life has the potential to shape our identities. Through the practice of confession, I discovered transformation and slowly learned to reshape my identity. I was, as a young child, I was under the control of deliberate power that mapped out my life and my boundaries. I was assigned a role and I decided to excel at it. And um, when we were in church, I would see these girls going into this little room and I thought, what are they doing? in there, and I was always a very, very, very curious child for which I got a lot of strappings. And um, I would watch them and they'd come out and they'd kneel and then they'd leave. And then when it was my turn to start learning about it, I was so excited. And you know, when, when they brought up the notion of sin and I thought, I am going to be the best sinner there is, and Father will be so proud of me. You know, the priest, you know, not knowing, because they made such a big deal of it, right? That you thought it was something great. And at home, our people never talked about sin. They just, you know, they, it was a harsh life, and we, we went hungry, but I never saw myself as poor. In residential school, I learned to think of myself as poor in many, many ways. And um, um, so, you know, and as I said that when I came into residential school, I already had a spiritual connection. And I know now today, I was already a success story. And, um, and there was spirituality of life and people, don't think of little things as spiritual, but they are. The, sp the spirituality was a way of life by my people and my family, the Crees and the Denis in Broche. There was always bannock and tea on the table for visitors. And the reason I do my prayer at the beginning is because of gratitude. Gratitude is something that connects all tribes, all nations, all people. We can that's a place we can uh, find um, togetherness, that we can find as um, 
a little point, focal point, to start conversations or to start a relationship. The men took off their hats at the table, at the door, which signified respect, and the guests were seated at the table. And I remember um, we would, I would hear the boat coming, and this was after the men had been fishing all day. And I would run down to the shore, and they'd come, you know, and I'd walk up with them. And after the guests were fed, there was conversation, storytelling, teasing, and laughter. The spirituality of hospitality, nurturing laughter and sharing brought closeness to family and community. And when my mom passed on, and um, I took to hanging around an elder, Caroline, who took me to many places. And this gentle, caring woman and I would get into a canoe and paddle to islands to go berry picking. Her silence when she paddled taught me mindfulness. The sound of the paddle slicing, slicing through the water, then the drops of water as they hit the water from the paddle was mesmerizing. Her slow, methodical search for food demonstrated her patience. The spirituality that influenced even the smallest of her actions revealed her belief in a higher power. Daily activities like these were demonstrations of the spirituality within my people. My story. The little girl of five entered the cold steel doors of the strange huge building and was met by two women who wore long black dresses and spoke a foreign language. She stood in front of the other girls, unruly curls hanging down to her bum, and beside her, her little trunk filled with candies Her father had packed the trunk, and she left the community in the woods by plane, a scary, noisy machine made of metal which took off from the frozen lake. Her sister was beside her, but it was of little comfort as she saw everything she saw was overwhelmingly strange and frightening. She had cried almost the whole way. She just wanted to be home with her mama, papa, brothers and sisters in the small warm cabin in the woods. When nighttime came, she could no longer hold back her tears. She cried from her heart and soul because she was lo so lonesome, displaced, and heartbroken. And um, when I went into um, residential school, I had my emotions. Uh, you know, the laughter, the, the joy, the happiness. And um, very rarely was I lonesome. And, um, and I didn't ever feel displaced. So when we went in, one of the first things you do is you need to cut those emotional ties that you don't feel that loneliness. And I couldn't do it the first year. So I think I cried for like three months every night. But I could not cut it, cut it at that point. Today, I can shut my emotions just like that. And you know, sometimes I'll have family that pass on, and it's difficult for me to cry. So that's something that I have to look at how I gain that back. But I did feel loneliness at one point, and it was very scary. And I understand why people go back into the box they're in. And my sister said to me, I can't take down my walls. They're too high. So you know, when you look at people um, that have been broken, and you look at the people that are homeless and they're on the street, and they've been made to believe that is where they belong, and they do feel like that. You know, don't look down on them. Always remember, try and remember what did they go through, because Probably 90% of the students went through sexual abuse by nuns and priests. And that's a very difficult thing when you're, you've been there for a long time. So, you know, with our emotions, 
you have to break it or you know it's that's that's life right and um And as I said, I cried over the winter, and then my brother would be brought in from the next building to come and sit with me. And after that, I watched the girls. I copied them, to starting to speak and learn English. And I used to go to the classroom. I, they gave me a doll, and I learned to be quiet. And this is very difficult for a child who's always been a chatterbox and running around in the bush you know, by ourselves, screaming, chasing squirrels, playing house on the rocks, and just being creative and curious, because those two were not allowed. And she watched as the women in the long black dresses trapped students, but couldn't understand what the students had done wrong. She understood pretty quickly that all the students were bad. It seemed to her that she was here to learn how bad she was. And that is what I remember. That's why this is so important for me to have written this. And even when I wrote it, I didn't realize the extent of the devastation of my spirituality and me in what I'm reading. So I went to, um, like I said, I saw the girls go into the confessional and um, So began her introduction into the world of sin. The little girl sat in the pew and stewed about her first confession. She was very excited that she was now one of the bigger girls who would be allowed to go to confession. She had learned to speak and understand English. It was hard to try and think about the sins that she committed. And I will tell you, I spent a lot of the day thinking, how bad am I? What have I done wrong today? And, um, the, and uh, the little girl stood in front of her locker holding her tongue. We'd be made to hold our tongue sometimes for hours because we had spoken when we weren't supposed to. Oh, why can't I learn not to run and play after dinner? Why can't I listen? Now all the girls are being punished because of me. Sister has told me so many times how bad I am and how God And how God <clears throat> does not like bad girls. But I was so happy and excited that I just had to run and peek to see if sister was coming. So when we're done lunch or dinner, we had to go to our lockers. You couldn't talk. But I'd run to the door and peek. And of course, he'd see Mia. And she would say, come here, you know, like to the front, and they would strap you bare bum. And the, all the girls had to stand in front of the lockers. The little girl was told to go to her bed and take her bottom pajamas down. Sister strapped her bottom with the bottom sole of a moccasin. This was almost a nightly event. This is separate from, you know, the after lunch. Why can't I learn not to whisper after 7.30? Why am I so bad and so disobedient? I am sure that sister can see inside of me. I have to learn not to laugh. I must learn to look like I'm serious and thinking about being good. Because if you laughed, that was a no-no as well. It was frowned upon. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. This is my first confession. I screamed 20 times and ran down the hall 10 times. I did not listen in class when the teacher was talking as I was daydreaming. I was lazy. I got into a fight with another girl and had my dress torn. I lost my comb. I did not go straight to my locker after lunch as I was supposed to. I whispered after 7.30 every night and sister spanked me. I cheated 30 times and stole 20 times. I lied 80 times. I am sorry for these and all the sins of my past life. At the age of seven, she was proud of herself because she could think of so many sins to confess. 
The cheating and stealing were the greatest things she could think of, and it made my confession longer. It was, um, and I didn't cheat, I didn't lie either. I, uh, I didn't cheat, and I didn't steal. Father should be proud of how great a sinner she was. Confessing about the lying at the end should cover her lying about the cheating and stealing during confession. Because I remember I had to put it at the end because I was lying as I was confessing. So I thought God will forgive me for this, you know. Anyway, um, so began her introduction into how she judged and continues to judge herself today. She was learning to be who she was told she was. Um, okay, the, the little girl was daily ch ch chastised about how bad and unworthy she was. She thought, I'll be worthy if the sisters see me pray and obey the rules. I'll be worthy if sister smiles at me. I'll be worthy if sister sees how well I can clean up and stay in a straight line as I walk down the hallway. However, she would always get into mischief unintentionally at first, then intentionally as she got older. So as I became a teenager, I became um, more um, rebellious. And um, uh, at one point, I was playing in the bush, and we couldn't go in the bush. And I was uh, making sand pies, and I peeked, and I could see a can. You know, and it was such a treasure, you know, when you have limited playthings. So I ran in the bush, and the nun must have kept an eye on me because I was always in trouble. And over the intercom, she said, Mary Jane, come here. Come upstairs. So I went, and she made me kneel in front of this statue to pray. But of course, I didn't pray. She left. So I, I found a pin, and it... The statue was missed out of the plaster of Paris, so I started scratching Blessed Virgin Mary. And it was so soft, I couldn't stop. So I put Blessed Virgin Mary. Another girl came. So we were both there and chatting, and the nun came. And she was gonna speak to us, saw the statue, and she said, who did this? And I said, she did. And she said, okay, go, and I ran out. And it was in my head. I don't know what they did to her, but I thought of her, and I saw her maybe in 2000, maybe 15 years ago. I ran to her. I said, Doreen, I am so sorry. She didn't even remember it, you know, but it was just something that... Um, yeah, and then, uh, so bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been three weeks since my last confession. I disobeyed sister and did not pray as I was told to do. I was bad because I didn't listen. I was bad because I blamed another girl for something I did to the holy statue. I had bad thoughts. I was angry. In religion class, sister told us about the three parts of God, and I told her I didn't understand. She told me that it was a sin to question and that I must have faith, but I don't know what that is. I cheated 10 times and stole 15 times. I lied 60 times. I am sorry for these and all the sins of my past life. And I was really good at getting girls together to leave the boundaries we had. So when we were in the playroom, there was a door and We'd watch the nun, and then we'd run out and run around outside. Or we'd go out of the cafeteria and run there as well. And then we had to sneak back in, of course. A few times I was caught. Uh, we were caught. And, um, you know, and bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Father, I am still, I still am having a hard time listening and obeying the sisters. This week I was picked to be in a play and I was very excited. Sister told me not to be proud as vanity was a sin. And um, when the boys came, the six, seven years of age, I was 12 now, walked by, I screamed at this little guy, his name was Nicodemus and he was from my reserve. 
and sister told me I was boy crazy. And my teacher walked by Mr. Melnick, so I screamed at him too. And she said, she goes after the teacher as well as the little boy. I'm sorry for these and all my sins of my past life. And with residential school, there, there was that grooming, sexual grooming that went on. And um, you know, whether it was through lectures or whether it was um, real time events, that there was grooming and that, um, you know, so at the end, I had really no con conception of sex and what it meant and how healthy it could be. But that was because we were just, um, there, were, there was no um, conversation on healthy sex and being a healthy parent and being a healthy woman. We were just bad women, bad women, yeah. And um, so one time I went, I said to my friend, come on, let's go visit the boys. And the girls' dorm is here, the boys' dorm, and there's, there's, don't, you know, like classrooms, but bedrooms on top. So they, they had the flu, so I went up, went across our dorm, Run across the nun's dorm, the teacher's dorm, and into the boys' dorm. And we were visiting with them. It was the, the little boys. And one of the boys said, the supervisor's coming. So we stood in the shower like this. And he only checked the bathroom, not the shower. And then we came back. Uh, he came back and said he's gone, and we ran back. Things like that, now I was not telling the priest, right? I was starting to be, um, I don't know if manipulative is the word, but I knew I would get into trouble. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been two months since my last confession. Since then, I have missed going to church on Sunday four times. I have been greedy, lazy, and vain. I have lied 30 times. I'm sorry for these and all my sins. And Father said to me, are you finished? I said, yes. And he asked me, do you let boys do bad things to you? So it was never ending. It was always that there was something wrong with us, that there was something faulty with us. So can you blame us if at some point in our life we did look at ourselves as faulty, you know? And when I realized I was this glorious spiritual being, I thought that's enough, no more. And I started looking back at that little girl that was five and what she had learned and starting to take, starting to talk about my experience. And, um, but it was this, um, that notion of sin that was the most devastating for us. It, that was the, the core, eh? the foundation of their ability to manipulate us. And, um, you know, and people today still practice the Catholicism. I don't. I've, I'm starting to relearn my own spirituality again. And I pray. I never, ever lost faith that there was a higher being, never. I always knew there was. And um, so, you know, it's, it's been a long battle because I've started, not battle, but a journey. And, um, and there's times, um, you know, in Senate when I'm in Ottawa and I go and speak, I have to really pray that my spirit will overpower my ego because I think, who am I to stand here and take up valuable, other senators' valuable time by bringing about indigenous issues? You know, and it's easy to fall back and think you're not worthy. This, you know, 
but of course I, I get up and I speak. And I think last week was my most confident I ever was because I had come back from the Pope. I went to the Pope's apology and really looked at my relationship with, with the church and where I wanted it to go. And I said to one of the nuns, I still keep in touch with one nun, she was like my mother in school. And I said, you know, he's just a human being. And she said, well, of course. I said, but you always told us he had the divine in him, you know, that he could make no mistake. And, you know, and I acknowledge he came here, that he was very frail, and he still made that effort. I have to see, try and see both sides. But um, I knew that his apology, I didn't need it, but that other people did. And I also saw people falling back into being the colonized. And one of the most, the ways you can really see colonization is learned helplessness. You know, because you've been told, don't do this, don't do that. And then you just sit and you wait for them to tell you what to do and how to do it. And when you sit and wait, because that's what they want, then they say, what's wrong with you? How come you don't do this by yourself? So it was never a, a never winning situation. And the reason I share my story is that I would really like to encourage everyone in this room to look at other people with compassion, because we never know what they went through. And that is part of our earth journey, that we come here with gifts, every single one of us, and it is up to us to unwrap those gifts that are in us. No one can give them to us, like intelligence, um, the compassion, the courage. We all carry that, and you have to dig deep and bring that out. Because at the end, the creator isn't going to say, why weren't you like me? He's going to say, why weren't you the Mary Jane I made you? You know, you could have been. And, um, you know, and I'm 70 now, and I'm going to, you know, you're, I'm starting my, my de decline in life. So I, I don't have that much time to, to do the things that, that, that I would like to do. But, you know, this is one of them where I really feel people, you know, that I might contribute in some way towards reconciliation and conciliation because we cannot do anything until we reconcile ourselves. And only from there can I move and learn to be compassionate with people um, that see differently from me. And it's, um, it's a privilege for me to be in Senate, which is where the policy of residential school started with John A. McDonald, and that I'm a residential school, and we're there to build education awareness of how devastating that was. And assimilation would, would, was never, ever going to happen. Never. Okay, so I wanted to, um, and I believe I rely a lot on my dreams. A lot of indigenous people do. The woman held the baby wrapped in a blanket and sat in a chair. The chair sat on top of a shiny, smooth black rock surrounded by water and in a black cavern. There was complete darkness, but a light shone on the woman and child. All around the rock were four-legged, slimy, gray creatures that were looking hungrily at the child. They would attempt to slither closer to the woman and child. The woman leaned towards the creatures and said, you are not going to get this baby. She threw out as much love as she could from her heart and spirit, and the creatures backed away. In her dream, she realized love is the most powerful weapon, and she woke up. 
In the book, Nourishing the Soul, there's a short story titled Feeding the Demons by Saltrim Alion. In the book, it advises to dig deep and see what is creating and continuing the disharmony and dysfunction in one's life and to give the root cause a physical form. In that instant, I realized that the woman in the dream was me, but the baby was me as well. That I still needed, haven't fully healed, you know, so I need to be protected and I needed to be loved. With the years of shame-based upbringing that reshaped my identity in residential school, I had learned not to love myself. And when I allow myself to shame me now, which I can do very easily, and usually for no reason, I visualize those creatures and throw as much love at myself as I can. Taking ownership of my story will allow me to retain hope and know that I can love myself in my imperfectness. So when um, we look at, um, you know, at what, I give talks sometimes about what's inside the box. People say, think outside the box, but you cannot until you know what's inside. So what was in this little box that the children climbed in? individually. And I said, you know, like they threw, took out creativity, they took out curiosity, and they put in blind obedience. And as they do that, your walls start to build, you know? And so um, I don't have time. I think we have uh, 10 minutes. And I wanted to, to have another one quote Richard Wagamese again. Um, but there's a lot of, um, you know, the self-determination that they took away from us, the, oh, I lost my spot. No, I've lost it. But did anybody have any questions? or any comments. I know it's a difficult topic. And um, I just thank you for, for listening and for being here with your spirit, your, your thoughts. And you know, it's, like, it's events like this that give me great hope because we have such a great country and we need to walk down it together, side by side. So thank you. Oh, and the reason I wear my red hat is the same reason why I, I pray, because we were told to be invisible. So I wear my red hat to say, no, I'm not. I'm here. And I love hats. <laughs> OK. Um, I'd like to thank you, Senator Mary Jane McCallum, for coming to share a very difficult story of um, hurt, pain, sadness. Um, it's difficult for all of us to sit here and, and to listen and imagine what it would have been like for a young child to have that experience. And I think t this week is a reminder for all of us um, with being Reconciliation Week and Reconciliation Day on, on Friday of, of things that we need to keep thinking about and grappling with and trying to understand from our perspective as well. So thank you for your time today. Um, we're very proud that you're representing us in Senate, and we're very happy that you took the time to come and share your experience with us and the University of Winnipeg community. I'd also like to thank Ramona, who, Ramona Hallett over here, 
um, who has arranged um, to have you come and has done a lot of the organization of this event behind the scenes and to the Weiwini Lecture Series group and all of the people working to create more meaning for Reconciliation Week this week. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.